I believe it's important that we continue to upgrade and update our faith formation, our continuing effort to get to know Christ in our lives. That's what our Christianity is all about, having a personal, loving, abiding relationship with God. And so Bishop Bruce is here tonight to speak to us about that personal relationship. Bishop? Great, thank you. It's great to be with you. I hope Lent is going well for you, huh? And you're suffering well, <laughs> right? <laughs> or is it you're just kind of getting through it, you know? How many of you have, have uh, your Lenten resolutions have already gone by the wayside? <laughs> but the nice thing is you can always start again. You know, we still have, this is only the second week. Right? We have many more weeks left. So let's uh, begin tonight with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we gather tonight and we praise and thank you for your love, for your mercy. We thank you for your desire for us. Yes, you're, we are your heart's desire and you carry each one of us in our own unique way in your heart because you desire to continue to nourish us and to strengthen us, to bolster our faith and our commitment to a life of faith in your son, Jesus. We pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon this, on us this evening. Lord, whatever words I have to say, I mean, they, hopefully they will touch the hearts of, of the folks who have gathered here, um, that you'll touch their hearts in the way that they might need to hear you the most. But pour out your spirit, continue to guide our lives to you and to your son Jesus. Help us to clearly understand the invitation to which you share with us each and every day into that life and love and mercy of your heart. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, when I was asked to give this talk, I said, well, what's the topic? <laughs> and they said, spirituality. And I said, wow. I took like, like four semesters of that. <laughs> and how can I cram it down to what, I, what do I have? One hour? Is that what I have? One hour? But actually, I'm not going to take a whole hour. I wanna, I'm going to take probably about 45 minutes or so. We'll see where we end up. And then I would just, I think it'd be important if you have questions to be able to answer questions that you might have or comments or um, um, that you might want to share yourself. But, you know, when we talk about spirituality, I think it must first begin from the premise that as a human person, each one of you, and this is something we don't always think about, each one of you have been created in God's image and likeness. Now try to put your arms around that. I have been created in God's image and likeness. Think about that. I have been created in God's image and likeness. Right? And isn't Jesus the perfect image of the Father? Right? He is. So in some sense, we have been created in his image and likeness. Right? In other words, you and I in some sense are called to be him in the world today and to do what he did and what he continue, still continues to do. And some of you might think, well, I have no power to do that, right? How many of you think that? That's not true. How many of you were baptized? <laughs> so when you were baptized, he came into you. Jesus is in each and every one of us who have been baptized. Think about that. Right? And that's in some sense, when we talk about this relationship with Jesus, we don't have to go out and search for this relationship with Jesus. We already have it. Right? We already have it because he's in us. Right? He's a part of us. Right? So we don't have to go searching we just have to have to ask him to make it come alive in us, 
right? To make it come alive and to make it to be what he desires it to be. But that's the beginning point. You know, it's the premise that you and I uh, have been created in God's image and likeness for God and for God alone. For God and for God alone. We've been created out of love and for love. So Christian spirituality is, is in, in essence, in some ways, if we look, if you want a kind of a definition of that, I, I think it's, in some ways, it's man's quest for God, our creator. So if we want to live this, if we want to live a, a, a Christian or Catholic spirituality, it's about us pursuing God and letting ourselves be found by God because God is always there. You know, it's our request, for, it's our quest for a relationship with the God who loves his creation. Remember, go back to the book of Genesis, right? God created this and it was good. God created male and female and they were good. So everything God created, the whole world, every part of creation has been created out of love, right? And it continues in being because of love. You are living here tonight and breathing because God deeply, intimately loves you, right? And if he were to shut off life right now, he would continue to love you because now he wants you with himself for all eternity. How many of you get up thinking this morning about that? Huh? Because if we begin to think about these things and they begin to orient our day, they begin to orient all of our relationships. And they have a profound impact on our, on our relationships with those around us. So this Christian or Catholic spirituality is really is our quest for God. The one who has created us out of love. And the one who loves his creation more than we, we even know. You know, in the, from the catechism, the scripture and tradition never cease to teach and celebrate this, one fun, this fundamental truth. The world was made for the glory of God. Each one of you were created for the glory of God. Think about that. It's kind of hard to get your, it's kind of hard to get your mind around that, at least for me, right? You know, I've been created for God's glory. Me? Like, me? Really? But that's, that's the truth. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the truth. St. Bonaventure explains that God created all things not to increase his glory, but to show it forth and to communicate it. For God has no reason for creating man than his love and goodness. That's it. You're in this world because God loves you. He's created you out of love and for love. Okay? But, oftentimes, this intimate and vital bond of God, again, in the catechism, can be forgotten, right? It can be overlooked. We can just kind of go through life like every day is the same, right? Um, we never, perhaps we, go through, we went through the day and never really thought much about God today because we got up and got dressed, we turned the, turned the TV on, we, all the noise around us, and we just kept going like every day. And we never really stop to think about the profound love that God has for me. Hmm? And some people even explicitly reject the Lord. And so such attitudes can have different causes. This is from the Catechism. Revolt against evil in the world, religious ignorance or indifference. We live in a world today with religious indifference. The care and the riches of this world, the scandal of bad example on the part of believers, that's all part of this clergy crisis of sexual abuse. Current of thought that's hostile to religion. We live in a culture that's, that's hostile to religion today. And finally, that the attitude of sinful man which makes him hide from God out of fear and flee his own call. Right? Let's go back to the Garden of Eden. What happened? Adam and Eve, they had everything. Right? They had everything. They were lacking absolutely nothing. They had the fullness of life there. The only thing they could not do was what? Eat from the tree. Right? They had everything. They lacked nothing. They had the fullness of God. 
And they would always have it, except you can't have this. Right? What happened? It wasn't enough. Everything that God gave them wasn't enough. They wanted the one thing that God didn't want them to have. And so the evil one entered in, tempted them, and said, oh, God's just playing games with you. Right? He doesn't really mean that. Right? You know? You don't have to pay attention to him. Nothing's going to happen. In fact, if you eat this, you're going to become like little gods. Right? Right? We all want to be, because we all think we're little gods just by the way we act. All of us do sometimes. Right? And so they caved. Then what did they do? <laughs> what they do, then they started playing the blame game. Right? Adam was first accosted. He said, it's not my fault, it's hers. Right? Eve, she's the one that gave me the apple. Right? Isn't that what he said? She said? Or he said, and then what did Eve say? No, it wasn't my fault. You know, it's, it's, it's him, it's the evil one, it's the snake that told me to eat that. So then the blame game began. And that's, you know, then of course, original sin into the world. Out of, out of dis, it was disobedience. Because they could not understand the fullness of God's love for them. Right? They didn't get it. Or they didn't believe it. Or they rejected it. And then they find themselves in a state of sin and disobedience. Huh? So, although we can forget God or reject him, God never ceases to call every single one of us to seek him so that you and I can find happiness, find life and happiness, right? I mean, think, what did Jesus say? I came so that you may have life and have it in abundance. Now, how many of you are living life in the abundance that Christ promised you? Huh? Why is that? You know, why is that? I don't know, you might want to ask Jesus. Lord Jesus, why am I not living this life in abundance that you're offering me? Tell me. So I can choose that instead of this. Huh? It's all about, it's all a matter of choices. But, so the search for God demands of every person, every effort of intellect, a sound will, an upright heart, and a witness to others who teach him to seek God. It's about, an inten it's about being intentional in our relationship. Okay? That's about it's being intentional in our relationship. So Christian spirituality arose within, a, it came out of the, within the Jewish spiritual tradition of this God's abiding presence, this divine covenantal love. Because remember in the Old Testament, how many covenants did God make with his people? Many. How many were broken? All of them. Right? But God never gave up. So, so this Christian spirituality arose from this Jewish spiritual tradition of God's abiding love, this faithful covenant love, the living word of scriptures, the supremacy of divine law, and the necessity of worship and the practice of remembrance. So just go read the book of Psalms, all 150 of them, and they will bring you back this remembrance of what happened in the days of Israel. So, early Christian spirituality is centered on God's presence in Jesus and in the body of believers who unite, who unite in Jesus' name and teaching and in each person not only as a disciple but as a human being. So the goal of Christian spirituality is the recognition and enhancement of this divine presence which is at once both hidden and manifest and that's the mystery, you know. Part of, I think, one of the challenges for us as human beings is that in our culture today, we, we have a hard time living in mystery, right? We want to know all the answers, right? We want to know all the answers. We want to have concrete experiences because they determine an end or an answer. And we, and we just have a challenge of living in mystery, right? You know, how can we believe that the body and blood of, the bread and the wine is the body and blood of Jesus without living in mystery? Because it's a mystery, right? 
It's the mystery of God's love for us, but it's still a mystery, not something to be solved, but something to be received. And as we are drawn deeper into the mystery, the Lord unfolds it for us and brings us into a deeper meaning of what that mystery might be. And it's different for everyone because everyone is different in their own spiritual life, in their own relationship with the Lord. You know, one of the worst things that you can do when we talk about a relationship with the Lord is try to compare yourself to someone else. Oh, Bishop, you're so holy. I wish I was as holy as you. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> you wouldn't want that. But you know, people compare themselves, right? We can try to compare ourselves. Because oftentimes it's, it's not, and I won't say it's a competition, but sometimes it is. But I want to be like that person. That person's so holy. I wish I had that relationship with Jesus that, that you have. Right? But that's a mistake to, be think, to think in that way. We should be thinking, I wish I had the relationship with Jesus that he wants me to have. Because his relationship with each one of us is different. Right? His relationship with each one of us is different. Right? Like how many of you have kids? How many have 10 kids? Anyone? Had 10 kids. Let's have eight. Seven. Eight? We have eight back there? Eight kids. I guarantee you, you had a different relationship with each one of your children. And that was unique to them. I mean, there are some similarities, I'm sure. But there's also a uniqueness. Because everyone has it. Because Jesus is unique. He's a unique friend. And so we each have our own unique relationship with him. That's not like someone else. So I shouldn't want what, you know, St. Ignatius had. Why would I want that? I might want, some, I might want to learn from that relationship, but I don't want that relationship that he had with Jesus. Because that wasn't meant for me. It's like sometimes people say, we talk about, you know, Mother Teresa, she's this holy woman, right? Right? And we say, oh, I could never be like Mother Teresa. You're right. Right? Well, the beautiful thing about that, you're not called to be Mother Teresa. Thank goodness. Mother <laughs> Teresa is Mother Teresa. What's your name? Sylvia. Sylvia. <laughs> yes. So you're called to be Sylvia, not Mother Teresa. You're right. And you're called to holiness in the same way that she was, but it's in your own unique way. So you can be like her, but you're not called to be her. She was called to serve the poor. Right? In the streets of, in the gutters of Calcutta. You have not been called to that. But you have been called to live a holy life in your own unique way. That the Lord somehow reveals to us. Folks, I never wanted to be a bishop. I never thought about being a priest too much either. This was not my goal. Right? But somehow as I engaged this relationship with Jesus, everything changed. And so I didn't, I was called to something different, unique for myself, right? Because we're not called to be everybody else, we're called to be you. You are called to be you in your own unique way, in and through this relationship with the Lord, okay? In this beautiful book by Father um, Jean Corbon, a Frenchman, it's called The Wellsprings of Worship, he says this, the most fruitful activity of the human person now think about all the activities that you do in a day, right? Think about that. All the activities you did today. The most fruitful activity of the human person is to receive God. So anything you did besides that today was less fruitful. Because God has made us for himself. And so the most, the most fruitful activity is to receive him in our lives in a, on a daily basis. The most fruitful activity of the human person is to receive God. This is at the heart of any Christian spirituality, any Catholic spirituality, is to receive God. So how do we do that? Huh? It begins seeking this relationship with Jesus in prayer 
every day. You know, what I think it's, it's allowing the Lord Jesus to lead us to conversion so that we might experience in, in him in a new way. You know, I think, I've said this many times before, but um, the Lord Jesus, more than anything, wants a, a, a personal, intimate relationship with each one of us, right? Jesus, in fact, wants every single one of us to fall in love with him. Are you in love with Jesus? Are you deeply in love with Jesus? Who's married here? How many years have you been married? 56. 56 years. And I bet you are deeply in love with her. I love her intensely. Intensely. That's even more deeply. That's intensely. <laughs> That's beautiful. How did that happen? How did that happen? Jesus wants that same kind of a relationship with you. And you, and you, and you. This intense love relationship. But how many of us are living this? Huh? And how do we get there? How do I get to the point where, we, where I fall in love? with Jesus because if that happens then I will do anything for him right so it happened this relationship happened so let me share the dynamics of a human relationship so you met her right there was an, there was an encounter that took place right you were present to her she was present to you right communication took place and something in your heart changed. How do I know that? I know him really well. What's your name? What's your name? John Paul. John Paul. How, how do I know that? Because he wanted another encounter. He wanted another date. So you went on another date, right? And during this time, this encounter, you were present to him. He was present to you. Mind and heart. Communication took place. And something happened in your heart. How do I know that? Because you wanted a third date. <laughs> right? And so again, again. So over time, these encounters where you were present to the other person, mind and heart, communication took place. Over time, in these series of encounters, your heart kept changing. Right? And you were drawn into love in a quite unique way, right? To the point where you decided to get engaged because now you wanted to give your life to her forever. You wanted to give your life away. You would do anything for her, right? Because that's what happens. That's the dynamics of a, of, of a love relationship. Our hearts are changed. And, we, and I, I bet you became like her <laughs> and she became like you because what happens we take on the persona of the other person I talk to young people like this and the kids you know in high school and I say you have a best friend and I go through the same kind of thing and I said I bet you I bet you talk like that person you act like that person you think like that person and you probably dress like that person their best friend they say oh yeah yeah because you begin to take on the persona of the other person. Not completely because we're uniquely ourselves. We're unique, we're unique in, in and of ourselves, right? But we do begin to take on the persona of the other person when we have fallen in love with them. Or we're deeply drawn into this relationship. Now let's, let's, turn, let's move this into this relationship with Jesus. Jesus is in you, as I said earlier. Through baptism and the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ's spirit, his very spirit is in us. He's in us. Right? So how do we get to the point of falling in love? We call that, folks, what's an encounter with Jesus? What do we call that? What do we call that? 
prayer, right? Prayer. We call that prayer. But it's not saying prayers. Like, I think the church has done a very good job about teaching people how to say prayers, right? You can rattle off the Our Father like there's no tomorrow, right? But have you thought about what you just said? Or are there just words coming off our lips, you know? Without, with void of any, like, real serious reflection. Like, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, blessed hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, Lord, this day our daily bread. Now that's very different. Say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right? Do you see the difference versus saying a prayer versus really praying? I mean, we can pray prayers that are memorized. I mean, we can, we can say them or we can pray them. Right? We can say them or we can pray them. If we just say them, your relationship with the Lord will no, be no different a year from now than it is right now. Because you're saying prayers. You're not engaging a deep encounter with God. It's about where, where am I? Where is my mind and my heart when I'm communicating to God? I mean, how often when we say the Lord's Prayer at Mass, how many of you even think about God? That this is a prayer to God. Right? It's not just some nice prayer that the church gave us. This is my prayer to God. You know? And if, so is my mind and my heart connected to what's coming out of my mouth? You know, people want to know how to get more out of Mass. We'll start praying through the Mass instead of saying through the Mass. Right? And you will, I guarantee you. If your mind and heart is there, engage with what's coming out of your mouth. Right? I mean, you didn't just say all these many times, Honey, I love you. I, honey, I love you. I, honey, I love you. You said, Honey, I love you. I love you. She, she said that to you, too, I bet. Multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> because the mind and the heart was engaged with what was coming out of their mouth. Right? Because it's a relationship. And so, we got to stop just saying prayers. We have to pray. Engage our hearts and mind in this relationship. Even, even with these prayers that are wrote. Right? When you think about the Gloria. Glory to God and the Father. Peace on earth. Peace to people of the world. Isn't that nice? Instead of glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. We praise you, Lord. We bless you. We glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. My heart and mind is engaged with my voice just in this moment thinking about that. Praying that. Instead of just kind of going through the motions. You know? Does that make sense? So I'm engaged in an encounter and the more I engage in an encounter with Christ, with God, with the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son, the more I'm drawn deeper into this mystery, into the mystery of this relationship. Because relationships are a mystery. Even human relationships are a mystery. So if you, human relationships are a mystery, just think how deep of a mystery this spiritual relationship is is. Right? But we have to be engaged in it. Engaged in it. Right? Mind and heart, spirit, mouth, everything. Our whole being. We pray with our whole being. And if we're just saying prayers, we're not praying with our whole being. We're just saying prayers. You know? I have people tell me, well, I pray the rosary every day. That's great. So do I. But the question is, do I say the rosary or do I pray the rosary? There's a difference, right? Do I say it just to get, it, to get through it? You know? Or do I pray it? You know? Do I engage this encounter, this relationship with the living God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit? Huh? And so if, if I begin to approach this relationship with the Lord in such a way where I'm engaged, mind and heart and spirit, 
It's only the Lord that can draw me deeper into this relationship. But if I'm not present to the Lord, mind and heart, how can he draw me into this relationship? He can't. Because I'm not open to it. You know, I'm not. It's like if I'm walking down the street and somebody says, hello, Bishop, and I just keep walking. Was that an encounter? Yes. He encountered me. He said something to me, right? But I wasn't engaged in the encounter. I just kept going. So am I going to be changed by that encounter? No. No. But if I stop and spend time with this homeless person who called out to me and engage him, you know, even though it might not be the most pleasant experience, and I'm engaged mind and heart with this person, somehow in the mystery of relationship, the Lord is going to touch my heart. And I'll be drawn not only into a deeper relationship with this individual as a child of God created in God's image and like this no bad, no matter how smelly that person is. Right? But because God is in him, that homeless person, I'm engaging this relationship with Jesus too. And he's going to change my heart because of this encounter. Is it making sense? So people tell me, well, I want a deeper relationship with the Lord. And I say, so do I. And I want that for you, every single one of you. I want you to fall in love with Jesus like I have. But you have to put in the time. A relationship with Jesus, like this relationship between this couple, 56 years, you put in the time. You worked at it. You were connected to each other daily. And over time, this love has deepened and deepened and deepened and deepened and deepened. Right? If we don't pray every day, if we don't take time to be with Jesus, I don't want to say pray, I want to say, if we don't take time to be with Jesus and with the Lord every day, folks, I'm going to just be frank. That says something about my desire for an intimate relationship with Jesus. It speaks something. All of our th words, all of our actions, for better or for worse, whether we think about it or, communi or, know, or think about it or not, it communicates something. So my lack of a desire for prayer says is there's a lack, it communicates my lack of a true desire, a deep desire for this intimacy with the Lord. Does that make sense? A lack of a desire to be with this person indicates you're not interested. Right? I mean, in the end, that's really what it says. I'm not interested. Right? So I'm going to go find someone else. Right? So prayer is this personal, intimate encounter with, with the Lord, you know? So, when you fall in love with someone, won't you actually do anything for them, right? You love your kids so much, you would do anything for them, right? You'd take a bullet for your kids, because that's what love does. We surrender our lives to the one we love. So I'm gonna surrender my life for my child in this moment, because that's what's called for. I'm going to surrender my life to Christ in this moment because that's what I'm being invited into. That's what I'm going to say yes to, you know? And, and also what happens in prayer is that we discover who we really are, right? We discover our true identity. You know, most oftentimes, you know, we live a false identity. We, we live an identity that we've created for ourselves, which not, isn't necessarily the identity that Christ has given to us. Because our true identity is in whom? Jesus. It's in Jesus. And so, it's important to think about that, you know? It's, how do I, def how do I, I tend to, do I identify my life by this relationship with Jesus? Or do I identify my life with something else? The things of the world, more important. You know? When was the last time? So people always identify themselves by what they do. So I'm a, I'm a what do you do? I'm a doctor, right? Who are you? Sure. Which, what do you do? Uh, a homemaker. 
homemaker. You're a homemaker. What do you do? Who are you? A child of God. How many, how many times have you told that to somebody when they ask you that question? Who are you? I'm a, I'm a child of God deeply in love with Jesus. Now imagine the reaction you would get if you said that. Try it, seriously. You know? You open, oh, my name is Bob and, you know, I'm a child of God and I love Jesus. <laughs> People want to call the paddy wagon, I think. <laughs> I don't know. But, but, I, but I, the reason I'm saying that is because it's important for us to change our thoughts about who we are, about our true identity, right? If I think of myself as a child of God, as I, as I, if, if I think of myself as a disciple, a dedicated, true disciple of Jesus, if I think of myself as someone who loves Jesus deeply or someone who wants to love Jesus more, the more I think about that, the more I, become, I begin to take on that identity because the more the Lord convinces me of who I really am. And I don't have to pretend anymore. I don't have to pretend to be somebody that I'm not. I, can be, I, can pre, I don't have to pretend. I can be who I am, a child of God, a person whom Christ suffered, died, and rose from the dead for me, who loves me more than I can possibly imagine. And so because of that, my deepest desire is to give my life to the Lord in the most complete way that I can, knowing all my weaknesses and sins and everything else. So my life on earth takes on a whole different focus. That's the problem with our culture today is we are not eternal life focused. How many of you got up this morning thinking about heaven? It says something. This means it's not your heart's desire today. That's what it says. Even though you might think, well, yeah, I would love to go to heaven sometime. Not today, though, right? <laughs> I'd love to go to heaven today. Why wouldn't I want that? That's what I've been created for. Right? Right? So when people say, how you doing? I say, great. The only thing would be better if I was in heaven. Right? And people look at me. Right? The only thing better if I died and went to heaven. Today. Right? That's who, that's... But if we don't think about Jesus, we won't pray. If we don't think about heaven, we won't pursue it. Because you know what happens? We pursue whatever's in our hearts. If worldly things are in our hearts, and they are in all of our hearts, and I pursue them as well, so I'm not saying I pursue heaven every moment of the day, because like many, I don't think about it all that often. But I do think about Jesus every day, because I get up every morning and pray. No matter what time it is. I was up at 5 o'clock this morning, and I spent an hour and a half in prayer. Because, because I need him to get me through the day. Right? I need him in his love and his mercy so that I can become more like him. Remember when I said when we begin to fall in love with someone, we take on their persona. I want to take on his persona completely. And that will never happen if I don't spend time with him. It won't. That's the reality. You know? You get out of the relationship what you put into it. You got out of the relationship what you put into it. And it's beautiful. Right? I mean, how many of us would like to be 56 years deeply in love with Jesus? Right? And we can have that if we put the time and effort into it. If we put our hearts into it, our minds into it. We can have that. Because Jesus wants that for us more than we want it for ourselves. So he's willing, able, wanting, desiring. It's his deepest desire of his heart to give that to us. That's why he died. So we can have this relationship with us. So that we can experience this love and this mercy, his compassion so that he can convert our hearts. How many, think, how many of you think you can convert your own heart by doing this and this and this? Don't delude yourself. You can't. 
You can't. It's not possible. The only person that can change my heart is Jesus Christ. That's it. So I have to go to him and seek that. You know, you know what prayer is ultimately? Let me give you a simple definition of prayer. And I invite you to think about this and practice it. Come and sit in front of the Blessed Sacrament sometime and say, Jesus, because this is what prayer is. Jesus, I permit you to love me. Prayer is giving God permission to love you. Have you ever given God permission to love you? You should try it. Because now you've engaged this relationship and you're, you're saying, yes, Lord, I want your love. I'm giving permission for you to love me. Otherwise, you know, if we don't give permission, we're like this. Right? If we give permission, we're like this. Right? Right? So prayer, the simplest definition is giving God permission to love you. Right? Lord Jesus, I give you permission to smother me with your love. Sometimes, you ever get into a meeting? How many of you belong to parish councils or you get into a meeting and like this used to happen to me in parish council meetings all the time when I was a pastor. I would invite a parish council member to pray, to open the, open the thing with prayer, right? And they would freak out, <laughs> right? How many of that is you? Be honest, right? Why? Because you're afraid? And so the evil one makes you live in fear, not God. Right? You're afraid? You, so it's all about you, won't do it right. As if there's a right and wrong way to say a prayer from your heart. Right? You didn't have, when you were growing in this relationship and you were admiring one another, you didn't have it all written down. Right? It came from your heart. Right? Do you love Jesus? Let it come from your heart. Right? There's no right or wrong way to pray. You've been baptized. The Holy Spirit's been given to you. Christ is in you, so why can't you pray in public? What are you afraid of? There's no right and wrong way of doing it. And if you step out in faith and do it the first time, shuddering like you would, then do it again and again and again and again. And then you'll never be embarrassed to pray because it's not about what other people hear. It's about your relationship with Jesus and what he hears. Does that make sense? So why are we afraid? Why are Catholics afraid to pray? Protestants aren't. They're not. Why is that? Because they're bold. Right? They're bold and we're wimps. Seriously. If I'm afraid to pray in front of... Oftentimes I go to, I go to, I go to a, a family's house for a dinner. Right? And, I, and I, they want me to pray. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not the head of this household. You pray. You know what they, you know what they say? Bless us, O Lord, and these I give as we are about to be... And that's not a bad prayer. I like that prayer. I pray it too. But where's, my, where's the heart? A relationship with Jesus is all about the heart. Where's my heart? Right? It's about him. It's about him. Right? And the more we step out, and it may come out funny sometimes, and it, even when I pray out extemporaneously, it comes out funny sometimes. I don't really care. Because it's not about what comes out, it's the intent. It's what's in my mind and heart that matters, not what comes out. Right? That's it. It's about Jesus in this relationship. Right? So we should never be afraid to pray. And we should always pray, Lord, I give you permission to love me today. So all of St. Augustine said, you know, he says, all prayer begins with desire. Right? So when I go to pray, what is the desire of my heart? It's all about desire. Lord, the desire of my heart is union with you. Simple. 
The desire of my heart is to love you and to experience your love and your mercy, your forgiveness when I've sinned. That's the desire of my heart. That's a prayer. I just prayed a prayer, right? right? I didn't, it was not on the paper. I just prayed a prayer because it's, it's, the, it's the desire of my heart, you know? So prayer begins with desire. It is, it is sustained by God's desire for us. Right? We're held up, sustained. We're held up by God's desire for us. And it begets or brings forth a deeper desire for God. You know? I'm not picking on you two. What are your names again? John Paul and Joyce. Joyce. As you begin to date, right, and your hearts begin to change, right, you couldn't wait to see her again, right? You thought about her at work. You couldn't wait to get off work so you could get together again, right? Because she was the desire of your heart. Right? Since she was the desire of the heart, you were going to pursue the desire of your heart. That's prayer. The desire of our heart is Jesus. So we are going to pursue that. And, and the Lord kept deepening that. He begat that desire. That desire became stronger and stronger and grew and grew and grew. Right? So where you could say, yes, I want to spend the rest of my life with this most beautiful woman I've ever met. Hmm? I want to spend the rest of my life with this most beautiful man I've ever met. It's all about desire. And if I don't have the desire, then I have to pray, Lord Jesus, give me this desire for you in ways I've never had it before. Because I know you love me and I want to pursue you as much as you are pursuing me. Now imagine if you prayed that every day, right? And so this is the way, it's a way of a being that finds fruitfulness through this intimate love of God within us, with hearts yearning to receive more and more and more and more and more, and then transforming us, because love transforms us more completely into the image, especially the love of God transforms us more completely into the image in which we've been created. Right? It is, it is wholeheartedly believing in God's and the goodness of Christ's love for us. And then tasting, we'll use that word, taste, you know, we know what that is. And tasting daily this goodness of the Lord in his intimate love for you. You know, if this is the reality of our lives, then communion will be formed. Let me talk about communion. And yes, I mean this communion. I don't know if you realize this, but if you take the word communion and cut it in half, what do we have? Com union. What does the word com mean in Latin? With. So in this moment, when you come up to receive Jesus and his body and blood, and you take him into your body, it is in this moment you have the deepest union with Jesus. The deepest union possible. Period. However, that's the reality. That's the truth. But is that your experience? In order for me to be in union with Jesus, I have to be connected, mind and heart. And this amen is not just amen, it's yes, amen. So I'm thinking about what is happening in this moment of union with Jesus as I'm put, taking him into my body. That's why I tell people they, could, they would never leave the church if they were deeply in love with the Lord and they knew what this was all about. They would never leave the church, ever, because their hearts wouldn't let them. Because their heart says this is the deepest union possible to man in this moment. 
come on Sunday and come up the communion line thinking about that. And I promise you, this experience will be different than it was last week. Because you're connected, you're in this, this is a prayer moment. You are in prayer in that moment of receiving the one who loves you more than you can possibly imagine. The one that wants more for you than you possibly can imagine. The one that wants you to, to receive this life in abundance that he's offering to you. It'll change everything. You'll long for it even more because the desire grows and grows in our hearts. Does that make sense? I mean, that's the reality. I'm just, you know, that's the reality. You can accept it or not, but that's, what's, that's, that's what our Catholic faith teaches us in this moment. This is what's happening. And most people don't know. They, they've never heard this before, right? I used to tell my confirmation students back in, in Rapid City, like, okay, I'm going to tell you the greatest, the, the best kept Catholic secret. And I go through the whole Mass, or parts of the Mass, and talk about, you know, people think sacraments are things you go to, right? I go to Mass go to confession, right? I'm going to a wedding, go to a confirmation. So aren't these nice events that we go to, right? They're not events. If we diminish them down to events, we have diminished them, diminished them by like 99.9%. Every sacramental moment, which is a prayer, it's a prayer. Every sacramental moment is a personal, intimate encounter with Jesus himself. We have to have faith, but this is the reality. This is what the church teaches, right? This is the reality. So next time someone asks you where you're going on Sunday, don't say, well, I'm going to Mass, because you just, you just diminish the whole experience. Say, I'm going for a deep, intimate encounter with Jesus. Right? Tell them that. I think what we, the, way, the language we use and how we think about what we're doing changes everything. Right? I mean, it's different if I just said, I'm just going to Mass, right? Isn't that nice? Or saying, you know, I'm going to the church for a deep, intimate encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. Doesn't that change things? The way we think about it? Right? Doesn't that change things? The way we think about it? So let's start thinking about the true reality of what we're going to experience. Whether it be in the sacramental life of the church. Whether it be in, in a time of prayer. In our time for prayer. You know? Because then we become engaged in this relationship. Mind, heart, voice. We'll start singing in Mass when we never did before. Because we realize I'm voicing my love and glory and praise for God. And I'm not embarrassed by that. Even if I have the worst voice in the world, the Lord gave it to me, I'm going to make him hear it. <laughs> right? So it helps our full, active, conscious participation in this encounter with Jesus through the Father, because the whole Mass is a prayer to the Father. It's not Father's prayer, it's not my prayer. It's the community, it's the body of Christ at prayer, right? If you think about the words in the, in the prayers, we, our, us, that's not him alone. It's us, all of us. It's the body of Christ at prayer. I can go on and on regarding that, but I, I think I'm out of time, am I? Yes. Um, I just want one more thing because I think it's important regarding this relationship with Jesus and a desire for intimacy. Now, you don't mind if I go over a little bit, do you? Because I don't want to. Um, you may have somewhere to go, although there's nothing more important here than where we are because Jesus is here. Um, So prayer is this personal, intimate encounter with Jesus. 
I'm giving God permission to love me. I sit down to pray. Lord, could you fix this for me? Lord, could you give me this? Lord, could you take care of this? Right? So we, oftentimes when people pray, it's always about coming and asking for something. Imagine if every day you went and wanted, to, you wanted something from her. You, you think you'd be married 56 years? <laughs> you think that's a good relationship? But yet oftentimes that's what we do. We, and, and the Lord loves it. He loves it. He wants to know what our needs are, even though he already knows them. And it's good to voice them. But what I'm saying, if that's the only time we pray is when we go and we want something from him, that's not a very healthy relationship, I'm telling you. With the Lord or anybody else, right? It's not a healthy relationship. It's a selfish relationship. And selfish relationships produce no fruit, right? So what I perhaps will suggest is that when we go to prayer, yes, we can ask the Lord. First of all, we should never ask the Lord for anything until we first thank him for everything he's already given us, right? Because then our prayer is coming out of a sense of gratitude, not a sense of selfishness or entitlement or something like that. I mean, I, I, would, I should never go to the Lord and ask him for something if I don't first thank him for what he's already given to me. That's a grateful heart. Anything less than that is not a grateful heart. It's an entitled heart. Or it's, it's a heart that's not thinking about this love relationship with the Lord Jesus. So take time in prayer. Yes, you can ask him for things. That's important to do so. But come and, you know, I had a situation the other day. I went and, in the evening, I went and prayed. And I said, Lord, thank you. You know, I was so worried about this thing. And you took care of it. You took care of it. And I thank you. And I'm sorry I didn't trust you. Right? I mean, that's kind of a relationship type of comment. Right? Like a, a one of intimacy. You know? I'm sorry I didn't trust you. I should have. You know, but thank you for taking care of this. And giving me the, 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 the courage or the confidence in this situation. Thank you. You know, I didn't know what to expect, but... I had my, in my mind what was going to happen, and that's not what happened, so thank you. you know? So it's a relationship. It's a relationship built on love and trust and mercy and forgiveness and desire. Right? And desire. And desire. Lord Jesus, we give you permission to love us. permission to love us in ways that we have not opened ourselves to you. Break down, Lord Jesus, any barriers that impede that so that we can receive deeply of the cup of salvation here and now and so that we can return to you with deep gratitude, longing for the more, longing for this deeper intimacy, an intimacy that will continue to transform our hearts, our lives our very beings. Amen? Amen? Any questions? Does that make sense? I mean, was that perfectly clear? <laughs> I'll never know if it is or not, but... Any questions? Comments? Well, if he's calling you that, it might be true. <laughs> I don't necessarily need an answer tonight, but I would like to get an answer someday. I've asked this of priests and deacons. When you consecrate the water, the wine, and the bread, you don't always put the water in all of the wine. You don't have to. The principally is putting me in there with Jesus. Human and humanity with the blood of Christ. And if I'm left out of that, I get very upset about it. But it's not required to put wine in, or water in every chalice, in every cup. It's the principal chalice. It's not required. Right. And we pour water into the wine. We, I mean, we, we pour water into the wine. You know? 
if we poured water into all the ta- all the cups, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. The fullness of what we're doing is in the wine, all of it. Jesus doesn't Jesus doesn't compartmentalize things in such a way because it's really it's the intention, not all, not necessarily the action. You know, that's why a priest in the state of mortal sin could offer mass. He shouldn't, but he could. And it would be valid and licit. Because it doesn't depend upon the priest. It depends upon God. Right? That's it. Depends upon God. It's God's intention. You know, and the priest acts in, the pers- in, in persona Christi, decapitus the, the, in the person of Christ, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's, it's the action of God. It's the action of the Holy Spirit, not the action of the priests. And sometimes, I don't know, that's a whole other talk, but, um, but that's the reality. It's the action of the, of, of the Lord, you know, the action of the Holy Spirit, not the priest. The, you know, the Lord is just using the person, the priest, whoever it is, to be his instrument. But it's the, really the work of the work of Christ and the sacramental life. That's why I said every sacrament is a personal, intimate encounter with Jesus. Right? I ask the kids sometimes, like, who baptized you? And the first thing they go, well, Father, so-and-so. I said, no, he didn't. You know, Jesus did. You know, Jesus did. You know that oil that that you get baptized, you get in the water, Right? It's Christ. Or who, who's, I said, who's confirming you? And they would say, well, you are, Bishop. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I said, the Lord's using my thumb. But it's Christ. Because I said, so what are you anointed with? Chrism oil, right? How do you spell chrism? C-H-R-I-S-M. How do you spell Christ? C-H-R-I-S-T. So when we, at the chrism mass... When we consecrate the sacred chrism, it is Christ who comes into this oil. And that's why when you're anointed, it's Christ who is anointing you, using my thumb. Because he needs a human element in order to do that because we're human people, right? But in the realm of the spirit, in the realm of spirituality, it's the Lord doing this. It's Jesus who gives himself to you in communion. He just uses a Eucharistic minister, right? It's Jesus who forgives you in the sacrament of penance, not the priest. It's Jesus. This is a personal encounter. And, and this is, people are afraid they hate confession. I tell, make, I tell people, make confession your friend because it's Jesus who's the one who's healing you. He's the one who's forgiving you. He's the one pouring out and showering his mercy upon you. It's not the priest. It's Christ. So if we come to the sacraments with an expectation that we are going to meet Christ Jesus in this encounter, it changes everything. You know? So when someone's here being baptized, a kid, a baby being baptized, we're not meant to sit here and look at be spectators. Because grace from your baptism is still active. And by watching this baptism of this baby, we can reflect back and think about, this is what happened to me. The fullness of Christ's love was given to me in that moment. And that, I think, enlivens the grace that we have received. You watch your confirmations. Don't be a spectator. Think about what's happening to this kid happened to you because of Christ's profound love for you. When we begin to think about what's happening here, this is Christ loved me so much just like this. He's loving this child. It brings to life the graces we have received from the sacraments when we did receive them earlier. So the grace is active. It's always active, but we have to be conscious of it. We have to bring it into our level of active consciousness you know that's why when couples are having a hard time in marriage I say well um, think about the grace that you received in the sacrament of marriage 
Ask the Lord to bring alive that grace again because it's there. Rely upon the grace of the sacrament of marriage. It never goes away. It's always there waiting to be engaged again. And then helps when, when, that, when a couple begins to think that way, then it, because the Lord is present in the grace, right? And so it helps in the situation because now we've brought the Lord into the mess, right? And the Lord can fix any mess there is. There's not a mess that he can't take care of. That makes sense? Okay, any other questions before I'm set up? You're welcome. It's because, it's because I love you. Seriously. It's because I love you and I want you to experience the Lord's love in the ways you've never had before. Because I'm seriously, he will change your life. You, you won't believe what he will do for you. But you have to desire the relationship and you have to pursue it. A deep, intimate relationship takes work. Right? If I have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to spend time with Jesus, I will do it. Even if I only get five hours of sleep, I don't care. Because it's about the one I love, you know? And if I'm tired all the, throughout the day, he'll give me the strength and the energy to get through even though I had... Because prayer is meant... Not to be a burden, but it's meant to rejuvenate us. That's what it's for, right? When you, when you had a hard day at work and all of a sudden you got together in the evening, right? This time together rejuvenated you, right? Because that's what prayer does. It rejuvenates our hearts and our spirits, right? And it takes away the, the physical tiredness in some sense where it's not as so noticeable. You know, it really does. It does. You know, so how badly do we want this relationship with Jesus? That will, the answer to that question will determine your practice. Amen? Amen. All right. Shall we pray? Let's close in prayer. I kind of already did, but let's do it again. I love praying. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we praise and we thank you for all that you give to us. We thank you for your deep desire for each one of us, your desire for our hearts, your desire to renew, rejuvenate our spirits, your desire to bring us into a deeper life in you. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your desire. We also, in this time, we ask you to receive our desires, all of them. We all have them, many of them. We place them into your heart, Lord Jesus. Receive them. Receive all those desires. Fulfill the greatest desires that you think we need the most, though. You know, give us what we need most. Not necessarily what we want, what we desire, because our desires are limited. They're, they're, they're very limited in compared to the desires that you have for each one of us. But receive them. Give us what we need most. Send us forth in this season of Lent. Um, drawing us deeper into the mystery of your suffering and death. Because that clearly speaks, in, that, in those moments of your suffering and death, clearly speaks of your desire for us. Desire for our lives, our hearts, our holiness. But just as important, your desire for our sins. Yes, Lord, I, we know that you desire to receive our sins so that you might transform our hearts and fill them with love and mercy and forgiveness and transformation. Bless all who have gathered here tonight, those who could not be here that wanted to be. Bless those who are, might be suffering in any way, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. We ask, Lord, to pour out your healing abundance upon them, that they might experience your profound love in, this, in these moments, in these challenges. Give them the grace to unite their sufferings to you and um, on the cross, that they might find union there, Lord Jesus. And bless this community. Continue to Make it holy. 
continue to lead others. May it continue to lead others to the joys of your kingdom. May it continue to come alive in your love and your mercy. But bring us home, Lord Jesus, to the beautiful experience of heaven. But not just heaven after we leave this life, but heaven here on earth. Because you promise we can have this on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray for that reality to be amongst us. So we make this prayer now through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.